Let's pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time you've given us to study your word. I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, you may please speak to us personally and inspire us uh, and help us to behold Jesus in what we are about to study. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, in the past two weeks or in the past uh, three studies, we've been talking about what it means for God to talk to us, uh, that is through the study of his word, and what it means for us to talk to God, that is through prayer. But this evening, we want to talk about what it means to talk to others about Jesus, what it means to talk to others about Jesus. You know, not uh, very far from uh, where I live, uh, about two years ago, they opened a famous Indian uh, restaurant and uh, it's a fr- you know, they opened a franchise here that's popular all over the world. And uh, you know, I did not know about that, but one of my, uh, my boss, he was in England looking for an Indian place to eat somewhere. And since his location was uh, here, you know, his home location is here, it redirected him to a place nearby where we live. And so he surprised us one day with uh, taking us to this Indian restaurant, you know, famous Indian restaurant. And I remember when I went there, you know, I enjoyed my time there and then I could just not keep quiet. I know I would take my friends there. I would, uh, you know, suggest this restaurant to different people that I know that I'm close to. And as I thought about it, that is something like talking to others about Jesus. You know, when we taste the goodness of God, when we taste the uh, mercy of God, when we taste the justice of God, we are so happy about it that we cannot just keep quiet, that we want to tell our friends and family that they also can partake of that same goodness. They also can partake and taste the character of God. And so this evening, we want to talk about what it means to witness to others about God. You know, the Bible tells, as we saw in our earlier studies in the book of 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16, the Bible tells that God is love. It defines the fundamental nature of who God is, that he is love. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, the Bible makes it clear. I know it gives us a characteristic of love and it tells that, love does not seek its own. And so if God is love, he is not a self-centered God. He is an other-centered God. He is pleased about making the other person happy. And he wants to bless others. The Bible tells in James chapter 1 and verse 17, every good gift and perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So we see here that every good blessing, every good gift that you and I experience in this world is from God above, is from the father of lights and not from the father of lies. You know, God is the source of life. God is the source of light and joy to this universe. And this author writes of the book Steps to Christ, like the rays of light from the sun, like the streams of water bursting from a living spring, blessings flow out from him to all creatures. And wherever the life of God is in the hearts of men, it will flow out to others in love and blessing. You know, God bestows his blessing upon his people. God, he gives gifts to his people. And we as God's people, when we experience those blessings, we become a channel through which God bestows his blessings upon others. We also find that the greatest blessing that God has ever given to you and me is, you know, found in Jesus Christ. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible tells the following. It tells, for God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When the Bible tells us that God gave, just like he gives so many other blessings to us, gives us the blessing of food, the blessing of uh, clothing and shelter, and, and uh, he gives us wealth, he gives us uh, prosperity, when it's done according to God's will. He gives us family. He gives us friends. You know, God has blessed us all, but the greatest blessing that God has given to you and me is that he sent his only begotten son. And the reason God wants to give us is that he loves us. Blessings upon us springs from the love of God. Once again, this book, Steps to Christ, tells when the love of God is enshrined in the heart like sweet fragrance, it cannot be hidden. Its holy influence will be felt by all with whom we come in contact. The spirit of Christ in the heart is like a spring in the desert, uh, desert flowing to refresh all and making those who are ready to perish eager to drink of the water of life. A love to Jesus will be manifested in a desire to work as he worked for the blessing and uplifting of humanity. It will lead to love, tenderness, and sympathy toward all creatures of our Heavenly Father. You know, God, out of his love, gave his only begotten son. When you and I experience the love of God, the grace of God in our life, that same love that we experience will flow out through us to others. That same grace we experience will flow out to others through us. And the Bible tells us also in uh, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 8, talking about what was the mission of Jesus. You know, why did Jesus come to this earth 2,000 years ago? There is, I mean, Jesus coming to this earth is a historical fact and not a man-made uh, not a made-up story, but why did he come to this earth? The Bible tells in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. You know, Luke writes, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came to seek and to save the lost. You know, the Bible writes, in the book of John, chapter 1, in uh, John, chapter 1, and starting from verse 1. In John, chapter 1, and verse 1, the Bible tells, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So the Bible tells us that Jesus, he existed from time past eternity and that Jesus, he was existing with God, with the glory of all the angels in heaven above. But, and also Jesus created the heavens and the earth. But we find in verse 14 that John records, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, Jesus could have stayed back in heaven above, but he came down to this earth. He left the glories of heaven. He left the adoration of the angels. He left the closeness that he had with the Father, physically speaking, and he came down to this earth. He took on human flesh. He experienced pain just in you and I did because he wanted to understand what that pain means. And he came to minister to human beings and to give his life a ransom for many. And the Bible, I mean, uh, Steps to Christ tells us, this was the one great object of his life. What is it? To minister to others and to give his life a ransom for many. Everything else was secondary and uh, subservient. It was his meat and drink to do the will of God and to finish his work. Self and self-interest has no part in his labor. Amazing. 
No. We all, you know, sometimes we get comfortable, you know, we, we work hard in our life. We want to come up in life. We want our kids to come up in life and we become very comfortable. And, and I'm not saying it's bad. It's good for us to come up in life and to provide things for our family. But when we say that we need to leave all that and go, uh, you know, to a foreign land, be a missionary, it's a little hard for us. But Jesus, he had everything in heaven, but he left that. And my friends, the greatest motivation to reach out to others as Christians is Christ himself, because he left heaven and he came down to this earth to minister to you and me. It's not only Jesus, but we also find that angels are just like that. We know that angels are created beings in heaven above. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14, this is a record in the context of talking about angels, how Christ is superior than the angels. But talking about the angels, Paul records, writing to the Hebrews, he writes, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? So angels are called ministering spirits, and they are sent forth to minister to others who inherit salvation. You know, angels find their greatest joy in ministering to others. We find all the way from when Adam and Eve sinned, when the two uh, cherubims stood by the Garden of Eden to guard uh, the tree in the Garden of Eden, and down to the end time, to the coming of Jesus, and even to the third coming of Jesus, we find that angels are ever engaged in the work of uh, serving human beings in the work of helping human beings. And the book of Christ also once again comments that angels are ever engaged in the work, in the working for the happiness of others. This is their joy. That which selfish heart would regard as humiliating service, ministering to those who are wretched and in every day in and in every way inferior in character and rank is the work of sinless angels you know, if someone has very bad language if someone behaves very bad to us i mean uh, and if someone you know is not it's very poor and you know, they don't have, they don't dress like the way you do. You know, they don't talk like the way you do. They don't come from a background like you do. How do we treat those people? How do we treat those people? But we find here that angels, they find joy in ministering to people inferior in character and rank in every way. And then the author writes, the spirit of Christ's self-sacrificing love is the spirit that pervades heaven and is the very essence of its bliss. This is the spirit that Christ's followers will possess the work that they will do. When I read this statement, it was amazing. How do we treat people, though, those who look different than us and they behave different than us? They probably eat different than us. They dress different than us. Angels treat them with tenderness, with sympathy. They minister to them. And if you and I want to experience a little piece of heaven on earth, we ought to have that same love that Christ shows towards us, to others. In fact, we find in the Ten Commandments that the first four commandments has to do with love to God. And the last six commandments has to do with love to fellow human beings. And my friends, one of the greatest ways you and I can know if we truly love God is by seeing if we truly love our fellow human beings. The reflection of if we are keeping the first four commandments will be proven if we are keeping the last six. If we are keeping the last six. We find that all of heaven is engaged in the ministry to human beings. But we come down to this earth. When Jesus came to this earth, he called his 12 disciples. And I want to read um, 
about the early disciples that Jesus called. No, he came down to this earth. He was baptized by John the Baptist. And then we find in John chapter 1, verses 35 to 51. John chapter 1, verses 35 to 51. And you can just listen along or follow along in your Bibles as I read the story of how Jesus called his early disciples. And we can learn a very important lesson uh, from here. It tells us the next day, John was standing, uh, that is John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come, you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. Verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew. You remember we, um, in our previous study on how to study the Bible, we spoke about the importance of observation. So we're observing uh, who are the characteristics here? First, we know that it was John the Baptist and two of his disciples. And then we see that Jesus comes in the scene. And then we observe that John the Baptist is saying that Jesus, he's telling his disciples, look who's coming. It is Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, who he had uh, previously baptized. And so we find that John's disciples, they start following Jesus. And Jesus is asking them, why are you following me? And uh, and then he says, he's asking, no, what do you want? And he's saying, we want to see where you stay. And Jesus tells, you know, come along, you will see where I stay. And so verse 40 tells us who are those two people. One of those two people was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, going on in verse 41. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He, that is Andrew, brought him, that is Simon Peter, to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of, uh, no, yes, he says, John, you, you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. 43, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, that is teacher, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Powerful story. You know, John the Baptist, he's the forerunner of Jesus. As Isaiah prophesied, he has come to make the, you know, the, the way of the Lord straight. And John has two disciples, and John had previously baptized Jesus, his own cousin, and the next day, he finds Jesus walking, and he tells his disciples that are hanging out with him, look who's coming, it is Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And John introduces two of his disciples, one of them, Andrew, to Jesus, and they follow Jesus. And Andrew had a brother named Simon, which was also called Peter, and he introduces Peter to Jesus. 
The next day, Jesus goes to Galilee. And there in Galilee, he finds Nathaniel and he tells Nathaniel, follow, I'm sorry, Philip. And Philip follows him. And Philip goes in search of Nathaniel and brings Nathaniel to Jesus. We find in the work of Andrew, we find in the work of, um, of Philip, what Jesus wants you and me to do. Now, you and I have seen the love of Jesus. We experienced the love of Jesus. And Jesus wants us to bring our family. He wants to bring our friends one by one and bring them to Jesus, just as Andrew and Philip did. What an amazing illustration we find here. And Peter, he became one of um, Christ's closest disciples. And Peter, you know, preached this powerful, uh, powerful sermon on the day of Pentecost. And Peter healed the lame man. And the book of Acts is filled with disciples ministering for the risen Christ. And we find here um, an example of how it all started. It all started with one person inviting another person to come and see the Messiah whom they have experienced, whom they have experienced. In the book Steps to Christ, the author writes, so those who are the partakers of the grace of Christ will be ready to make any sacrifice that others for whom he died may share the heavenly gift. They will do all they can to make the world better for their stay. This, this spirit is the sure outgrowth of a soul truly converted. You know, if we are truly converted, we will bring others to Jesus. Tells, no sooner does one come to Christ than there is born in his heart a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his heart if we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ and are filled with the joy of his indwelling spirit. We shall not be able to hold our peace. If we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, we shall have something to tell. Like Philip, when he found the Savior, we shall invite others into his presence. We shall seek to present to them the attractions of Christ and the unseen realities of the world to come. There will be an intensity of desire to follow in the path that Jesus trod. There will be an earnest longing that those around may behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Andrew, he found Jesus. Nathaniel was called by Jesus and they brought other of, his, of their friends and family to Jesus and they simply said, come and see the Messiah that we've been studying about, that, that dad and mom taught us about, that our forefathers have been talking about. He is here. And they follow Jesus. There are other stories in the Bible. For example, Jesus healed, the, um, healed a demoniac by the sea. He was cutting himself. He was filled with demonic spirits. But when he was healed, he wanted to follow Jesus. But Jesus tells him, you go and tell your people, your village, what the power of God can do in their own personal lives. Jesus chose the worst, the demoniac that was rejected by society to tell others about Jesus. And my friends, you and I may be the most, you may feel that you are the most vile person in this world. But if you have tasted the grace of God, is if you have experience the forgiveness of God. God invites you to tell others about that same forgiveness that you received from God, that same love that you received from God, that others may experience that forgiveness and love that you experienced, that your mom and dad can experience that love and forgiveness, that your brother and sister can experience that forgiveness. We also find with the woman, um, woman by the well, I mean, the Samaritans and the Jews, there was, there was a wall between them. But Jesus broke those barriers. 
and he ministered to the woman by the well and eventually she experienced she drank of the everlasting water and she went to testify to her own village of this water that the everlasting water that Jesus offered to her we find in the bible these amazing examples you know when we minister with Jesus or for Jesus there are different blessings that you and i experience what are these blessings first we become co-laborers with god you and i we become co-laborers with god you know it's an amazing thing that god could use angels in heaven above to just come down to this earth and you know to um for them to share the glories of heaven to tell about the love of jesus there that they have been beholding for for all these years for thousands of years jesus could have done that but god he wants to work with you he considers a privilege to work with sinful mortal beings that they can tell others about jesus so first we become co-laborers with god when we do ministry when we tell others about jesus number 2 we feel we feel the need for deeper experience with jesus and the bible tells blessed are they which to hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled and the book steps to christ tells if you will go to work as christ designs that his disciples shall and win souls for him you will feel the need of a deeper experience and a greater knowledge in divine things and will hunger and thirst after righteousness you will plead with god and your faith will be strengthened and your soul will drink deeper drafts at the wells of salvation and countering opposition and trials will drive you to the bible and prayer you will grow in grace and the knowledge of christ and will develop a rich experience you know my mentor he often tells if you want to know more about the bible if you want to uh understand the bible more deeper go out and tell others what you already know because in turn they will ask you questions and it will force you it will drive you to go to the bible and wrestle with the scripture and as you do this every time ministering to others being challenged about a bible question as you go back and study you will become you will start having a deeper experience deeper knowledge in the things of god and i know this from my own self as no i i personally give me and my friend we give bible studies to others my friends this is a spiritual work and you and i we experience temptations and you and i experience trials from satan but for us to be effective in reaching out to others we need to guard ourselves and so it will draw us to the word of god to claim god's promise to keep us from temptation it will draw us to the word of god to experience the forgiveness of god so often to experience the love of god so often so we can minister to others it will drive us to the bible to wrestle with scripture that we may share with others it will give us a deeper experience with jesus when we go out and tell others about the things that we already know there are many many times in my life that i've gone on my knees and said god i cannot preach this next sermon this is just too much for me because of all the things that i have done and there in the closet there are times where i have to wrestle with god asking god lord please forgive me for the sin that i have done i'm not worthy to preach this i'm not worthy to share this my friends it will give us a deeper experience with jesus when we go out to minister to others for jesus so first blessing is that we become a co-laborer with god second blessing we feel we will feel the need for a deeper experience with jesus third blessing is that we start to develop a character of unselfishness you know it's easy for us uh to give tithes and offerings to church and you know the bible tells us we ought to give our tithes and offerings to church the bible admonishes us that but that's for a different time 
but god wants us to do more than give our money to god god wants us to go out and minister to others sit down with people talk to them provide them give not only our money but time and energy to others and when we do this we develop a character of unselfishness and this is the fundamental character of love because god is love this is the fundamental character of heavenly angels unselfish labor unselfish labor and you know we that leads us to this um other point that working for others ministering to others it will help us in our christian growth it will help us in our christian growth and you know we spoke about how the whole point of christian growth um is for the character of jesus to develop this character of love grace and mercy and forgiveness to develop within us and you know when we talk to others when we minister to others they will offend us for sure we will have differences of personalities we will have differences of opinion and that will really help us to grow in our christian character to know mercy to know when to talk and when not to talk to learn how to have tenderness and forgiveness for people those who don't look like us those who don't think like us those who don't dress like us those who don't work like us and so god has in store for you and me blessings as we bless others blessings as we bless others the bible tells us just before jesus ascended to heaven above he gave us a commission he gave us a work to the disciples of then and of today he writes in matthew chapter 28 verses 18 through 20 he tells and jesus came and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth then he writes go therefore well, we we saw in our previous study on you know how to study the bible it's important that we observe different words that word therefore means because of all the things that has uh that i have said before hence this is the conclusion and jesus tells because all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth therefore i want you to go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit teaching them to observe all things i have commanded you and lo i am with you always even to the end of the age jesus is saying you know i have all the authority and power and i am giving you that authority and power to go in my name and make disciples of all nations baptize them and teach them the things i have taught you we also find in acts chapter 1 and verse 8 jesus on the uh, mount olivet he he tells his disciples but you shall receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you and then he tells and you shall be witnesses to me excuse me in jerusalem and in all judea and samaria and to the ends of the earth now first he tells i want you to be my witnesses and then i want you to look at the progression he tells jerusalem judea samaria and to the end of the earth jesus is saying begin from home you know my mentor uh, also once said i'm paraphrasing i don't i don't remember the exact words but for you to go to all the world first you need to go across the street okay before you go to all the world you need to go across the street and so we need to begin from home you know one um bible commentary i like how um this bible commentary puts it you know jesus tells that you shall receive power that word power comes from the greek word dunamis which means strength ability power and the english word dynamite is derived from this greek word dunamis and the commentary writes look here refers to supernatural power received only by those upon whom the holy spirit comes this power is for witnessing for three things 
It gives power within. Number two, power to proclaim the gospel and power to lead others to God. This power is for three things. Power for within, power to proclaim the gospel, and power to lead others to God. Through the disciples thus empowered, Jesus would continue the work he began on this earth and even greater works than those would be accomplished. This spirit-given witness was to be a distinguishing mark of the Christian church. My friends, God has given his church just one work. And that work is to take this gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit to the entire world. And like I said, going to the entire world begins by going across the street. And you know, Jesus tells that you will receive power. And once you receive power, I want you to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. And talking about this word witness or witnesses, to be more specific, the Bible commentary writes, the word is used 13 times in Acts. As witnesses, the apostles knew Christ to be the Messiah of prophecy and the Redeemer of mankind. They could also testify of his promise to return. As witnesses, the disciples were the first and the foremost link of the visible evidence between the crucified, risen, and ascended Lord and the world, which through their testimony might believe. John writes, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, followers of Christ, Today are similarly called to bear personal witness to the works and the teachings of Jesus, to the purpose of God to save the world through his son, and to the effectiveness of the gospel in their own hearts. No more convincing testimony can be born. Without personal experience, there can be no true Christian witness. Peter's bold statement following the healing of the lame man is an excellent example of witnessing. In apostolic times. You know, we find that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John talk about Jesus and talk about his interaction with his disciples, but the book of Acts is filled with what the church, the early church did as a result of accepting the invitation of Christ, as a result of experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in their own personal lives. I mean, Peter, James, and John, they saw Jesus calm the stormy sea. They saw Jesus heal the demoniac. They saw Jesus healing the man with a pool of Bethesda. They saw Jesus uh, asking Lazarus to come forth. And they were witnesses of this powerful Christ, of this Christ who died, who said he will resurrect the third day. And just as he prophesied, he resurrected the third day. Thomas, he felt the hands of Jesus, and then he came as a disciple, and he came as an apostle, he came as a witness to our own country, India, to bring the gospel to our nation, because he saw the power of Jesus, what Jesus could do in his own life, and what Jesus did in the life of many others, and as you and I experience the power of the gospel, as we experience the forgiveness of God, the love of God, the grace of God, the Holy Spirit will empower us, to witness the same thing that we experienced to others around us, to our family and to our friends, to our family and to our friends. In closing, I want to get a little more practical. How can you and I be a witness? And what I'm going to share with you are principles, and I will throw out a few examples or specifics because, you know, in different contexts, um, the specifics vary, but the principles remain the same. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 20 and 24, the apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. You know, God has called you and I with we all have different callings in life. We often think that it is only the, the pastor or the, uh, or the minister of the gospel, someone who goes to the seminary uh, or to Bible college, only he is qualified to preach the gospel. No, 
The qualification for Christian service is for you to experience Christ. That's all. For you to experience Christ. And that is the only qualification that you need to share about Jesus to others. You may be an engineer. God, may, God has probably called you to be an engineer. God has probably called you to be a microbiologist. God has probably called you to be a physician. He has probably called you to be a teacher, a nurse. Whatever profession, maybe I, I forgot to name some professions for sure. A CEO of a company, a businessman, whatever your calling is, whatever your profession is, as a Christian, you only have one calling, and that is to be a witness for Christ wherever you are, wherever you are. You know, Jesus himself was a carpenter. And, you know, the author of this book, Steps to Christ, in you know, a powerful book, the author writes, the greater part of our Savior's life on earth was spent in patient toil in the carpenter's shop at Nazareth. Ministering angels attended the Lord of life as he walked side by side with peasants and laborers, unrecognized and unhonored. He was faithfully fulfilling his mission uh, while working at his humble trade as when he healed the sick or walked upon the storm-tossed waves of Galilee. So in the humblest duties and lowliest positions of life, we may walk and work with Jesus. You know, you may not tell to others that God loves you, or you may not sit down and give a Bible study to others, and you may not share a, you know, a tract to others, all those things you could do. But just by your work ethics, just by how you treat your co-workers with love and patience and respect, that in itself, my friends, is a witness. In fact, I want you to go to the book of Matthew chapter 24. The book of Matthew chapter 24, and we find in Matthew chapter 24 that Jesus is talking about the signs of the end time, and you know, Christ gives us different signs. And then in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, the Bible writes, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. That word witness. It means that we are living out the Christian life and people are witnessing not only our words, but also our actions. They're witnessing how we treat our family members. They're witnessing how spouses, they treat one another. They are witnessing how parents treat their kids and how kids treat their parents. They're witnessing how we treat our co-workers when they reject our project. They're witnessing all these things. My friends, they may not come to church. They may not receive a tract from you. They may not sit down for a Bible study. But as they witness you in different circumstances, exhibiting the character of God, they will think, how is it he's able to do? And my friends, you can be a powerful witness just by doing that. Begin by doing that. And the author of this book, Steps to Christ, continues, The businessman may conduct his business in a way that will glorify his master because of his fidelity. If he is a true follower of Christ, he will carry his religion into everything that is done and reveal to men the spirit of Christ. The mechanic may be a diligent and a faithful representative of him who toiled in the lowly walks of life among the hills of Galilee. Everyone who names the name of Christ should so work that others, by seeing his good works, may be led to glorify their creator and redeemer. So I don't know what God has called you to do, but whatever it is, he wants you to be a witness. He wants you to be a witness there. And of course, this is not going to be done in our own strength. It's going to be by, done by the power of the Holy Spirit, as we discussed earlier. 
You know, some may say, oh, I don't have the talent of preaching. Oh, I don't have the talent of giving Bible studies. But, you know, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 25, you can read, you can read that later on in your own in your own time from verses 14 through 30, how this, um, this man gives different talents to every single person. And he, and you know, he was going to come and ask an account for the talent that was uh, given to them. And everyone, they develop their talents and they use their talents. And, and Jesus uses that parable to say that God has given each of you talents. There is not one person without at least one talent in this world. Each of us have different talents to share about Jesus to others. And God wants us to use these talents. But let's get to the practicality of things. All right, John, I understand. But how do I do this? How do I share Jesus? How do I witness about Jesus to others? No one out there. In the book, uh, the Ministry of Healing writes, this is a powerful statement and writes, uh, this author writes, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. So what was Christ's method that will give you and me success? The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, won their confidence, then he bade them follow me. What did the Savior do? He first mingled with human beings desiring their good. No, not for selfish reasons. He sincerely desired their good. Then he showed them sympathy and ministered to their needs. And by doing that, he won their confidence. And third, he said, follow me. So three things. He mingled with people desiring their good. Second, he showed sympathy by ministering to their needs and won their confidence. And third, he bid, he bade them follow me. So how can you and I do that? We find in the scripture, Jesus himself giving that example. You know, if you go to the book of John, um, you know, my mentor had shared this in different classes and different settings. And this was really powerful um, when I learned this uh, myself. In the book of John chapter one, we find, you know, Jesus is introduced and uh, these early disciples, they follow Jesus. We saw how Andrew invited his brother Simon to follow Jesus. We find how Philip invited Nathaniel to follow Jesus. And they say, uh, you know, they just say, come and see, uh, you know, if this is the Messiah. But starting from chapter two through six, we find a pattern of how you and I can be an example, can be a witness for Jesus. How is that? You know, in John chapter two, we find that Jesus and his disciples, they go and attend the marriage or the wedding at Cana. And there, you know, they ran out of wine. And, you know, it's, it's not a good thing when, you know, in that day and age, if they run out of wine, in fact, even in Eastern culture today, if the food is not good, we're really not satisfied with that wedding reception, right? We say the food is bad. You know, we take we take pride in getting the best food uh, for your son or you no. Know, you get you take pride in getting the best food for your son or daughter. And you know, if it is bad food, it's really not good. You know, your relatives talk about it, your friends talk about it. It's really not good. And so we find the same thing at the at the wedding feast of Cana. They run out of wine you know not fermented wine you know good wine just pure tasty grape juice and the family is being embarrassed you know they're like what are you going to do but jesus he performs a miracle and he meets the social need of that family that day the wedding feast at cana it teaches us that Jesus met the social needs of people and you and I are to meet the social needs of our family members, of our friends and our society. In John chapter three, we, fee, we see that Nicodemus has been studying about this Messiah. You know, he's, he's observing this Messiah, but he doesn't know if he's really truly the Messiah. But Jesus that evening, he met the spiritual need of Nicodemus. 
And that gives us an example that there are people around us, they're looking for truth, intellectual truth and experimental knowledge. They're looking for answers in their life. And you and I, we learn from Jesus that we are to, we are to fulfill the spiritual needs of our family members, our friends, and of our society. In John chapter 4, we find this woman at the well. She doesn't, she comes, you know, in the, in the afternoon when nobody comes. So, she's a, she, so she doesn't have to face all the other ladies that would come to the well and talk bad about her. Jesus met the emotional need of the women that day. And she became a powerful witness for the people in her, from her own town. We find that Jesus gives us an example of meeting the mental or emotional needs of people around us. And finally, in John chapter 5, we see that there was this man by the pool of uh, uh, Bethesda. And, you know, every time this angel would come and, you know, the trouble of the water, the first one that goes inside the water will be healed. And he had his bed right by that pool. And this angel would come. And every single time he attempted to go, someone would go ahead of him. And he's been waiting there for years, somehow hoping, somehow longing, he can jump into that pool and be healed of his sickness. And Jesus came to that man. And he healed him. He met the physical need. But we find in John chapter 6, there's this group of people, those who have been listening to Jesus speaking. They're hungry, but there's this little boy. He only had a few loaves of bread and fishes. Jesus multiplies that and provides the physical needs of the people that day. So we find with Jesus that he's meeting the social needs of the people around him. He's, uh, he's meeting the spiritual needs of the people around him. He's meeting the emotional needs of people around him. He's meeting the physical needs of the people around him. You know, I want you to look around at your own family member, probably your own kids, probably your own parents, probably your siblings, your coworkers, your friends. Don't think about, you know, reaching tens and thousands of people. Start with one person. What need do they have? Are they feeling socially awkward? Not able to fit in? How can you help them? How can you be a friend to them? Or maybe, you know, that they're searching for answers in their life. Can you give a Bible study to them? Or someone is going through a terrible time during this COVID season. You know, we often think about uh, the physical sickness that people have. Of course, there is legitimate physical sickness that people have around us. But with quarantine, all of these things, people are getting affected emotionally and mentally. How can you minister to them? Can you make phone calls? Can you keep them in check? Can you help them with the routine of, you know, getting good water and, and recommending good books for them to read and videos to watch that would uplift their mental state. Maybe they have physical needs, people around you. They probably don't have proper clothing or food or they're just sick. What can you do to people around you? Jesus, there are three steps that Jesus followed to minister to people. First, he mingled with people, sincerely desiring their good. And that happens only with the grace of God within our hearts because naturally we are selfish. We want to please ourselves. You know, get into the closet and ask God, give me a burden and give me a desire for the good of people around me. Second thing that he did, he ministered to the needs of the people. And that's what we saw, you know, social need, spiritual need, emotional need, physical need. He ministered to those needs of people and won their confidence by doing that third. He pointed them to God or he bade them follow me. My friends, as we come to a close this evening, I want to challenge you. What need do you see around? I want you to have the eyes of Jesus 
and look at people. What need is my neighbor having? Are they sick? Can I cook a meal for them? Can I just go and, you know, just spend time with them talking, getting to know about who they are and uh, you know how, uh, you know, what work they do, where their, where their kids studying, you know, how's their time going during this quarantine? Have they lost their job? Is someone else looking for a person to work and so you can recommend them? I don't know what it is, my friends. That's why I give you principles that you can apply to your own situation circumstances of fulfilling social needs, spiritual needs, emotional needs, physical needs of people around you. When you do this, there is something that happens in your heart. When you start showing love to people, that love just flows from within to cook more for others, to do more for others, to spend time more with others. Or maybe just two more practical things. Maybe you're asking, John, I understand, but I don't know how to make friends. I really don't know how to make friends. I want you to remember an acronym, and the acronym is FORT, okay? It's F-O-R-T, and let me pull some, something up um, so I can share this with you. The acronym is called FORT, and F stands for family. And O stands for occupation, R stands for religion, and T stands for testimony. And let me just tell you what each of it is. Um, give me a moment here. You no, know, F stands for family, you know, just get to know their family, you know, uh, where they're from, you know, what is their... Uh, what is their background? And people, they generally love talking about their family, you know, their, their history, their grandfather accomplished this, their grandmother accomplished this, their father was such and such thing, or, you know, their child or their grandchild has won such and such award. And, you know, they may have these pictures on their walls. You talk to them about their family, you know, you know referring to the picture. You just ask them, you know, are you from this area? How long were you here? Where were you raised? Do you have family live close by you? Just ask about family. Second is, like you said, like I said, you know, occupation, you know, are they enjoying their job? What job are they, are they doing? And probably sometimes people are doing occupations because they are so talented there. So just talk to them about their talents and hobbies and just talk to them about all these things. Now, religion it varies from person to person. Maybe some are not comfortable uh, talking about it, but if you can just ask them, you know, what is their background? You know, what do they do? Just get to know, uh, get to know those things. And then finally you share your testimony as the time seems right. But how do you share your testimony? I want you to keep three things in mind. With testimony, you share first what your life was before Christ. Second, you share how you encountered Christ. And third, how that has changed your life. Okay, first you share about what your life was before meeting Jesus. Second, how you met Jesus. And third, how their life has changed, how your life has changed because of meeting Jesus. That is a simple way to share your testimony. And so, you know, there's a lot more that we can talk about witnessing and sharing about others, but I want you to keep this principle in mind of Jesus sincerely desire, getting to know people um, or mingling with people desiring their good, ministering to their needs, and third, just pointing them to Jesus. And how can you, what are the needs of our society? There is social need, there is spiritual need, there is emotional need and physical need. And so this evening, I hope and pray that the same love, grace and comfort and strength that you have received, that you've been blessed with from God, truths that you've been blessed with from God, you know, coming to Final Herald and learning all these truths, share with people around you. May God bless you as you make a commitment to reach out to your family members, friends, and those and your co-workers and whoever is around you. God bless you and